conflict from the section Living Faithfully Today in the fifth edition of Quaker Faith and Practice, section 20.67. This is George Fox in 1756. And all friends take heed of jars and strife, for that is it which will eat out the seed in you. Therefore ne let not that harbour in your bosoms, lest it eat out the good in you, and ye come to suffer in your own particulars. Therefore dwell in love and life, and in the power and seed of God, which is the honourable royal state. Conflict eats you away. Evil is parasitical. Evil likes to thrive on the pain of others. It's my interpretation. So this sex, next section is Sue, by Sue Norris from 1982, and the section is 20.68. I have heard some friends deny their anger in a silent peace where there is no understanding of each other. Such friends are angry, but by their silence, the progress of world peace has stood still. If we are angry, we know how wars develop. It does not matter who's wrong. What matters is that we care enough to talk to each other. So... It does not matter who's wrong, what matters is that we care enough to talk to each other. How do we become reconciled to each other if we are asunder? All I can say is to go up to that person and say what is in your heart, that their ways are hurting you, that their ways are hurting, but you still love them. But this takes time and not many people like to look in a person's face and find out who they are. So we miss the reconciliation and do not have the experience that we cared. Given that, then we, should know, then we will know who we are and find relief in tears we all should share. This is where peace starts. <clears throat> the next is by Kathleen Lonsdale, 1957. Section 20.69. If someone we love does have a bad temper, we try to avoid the circumstances that provoke it. If it is so easily provoked that we cannot avoid it, the soft answer may have to include, then or later, a quiet but firm reproof, for their own sake as well as ours. But very often our ability to cooperate peacefully with our family, our neighbours and our fellow workers does depend upon our knowing how, with courtesy, to refuse to be drawn into particular types of discussion or to take sides on questions which arouse needless passions. We may do this in particular when we know that they have violent prejudices which we do not share but which we are not likely to be able to remove by argument or when the dispute is about a matter of fact that could easily be determined by experiment or by consulting a work of reference. All these are the small change of everyday life, but they count for happiness in living together as persons, and they are a pointer to happiness in living together as nations. The next one is from Yearly Meeting in London from 1692, section 20.70. Where any have received offence from any other, first to speak privately to the party concerned and endeavour and endeavour reconciliation between themselves and not to whisper or aggravate matters against them behind their backs to the making parties and the breach wider. The next section is a, the longest one and it's written in 1986 by Mary Lou Leavitt. This is section 20.71. This is my favourite one. There are three steps of conflict resolution as outlined here. Conflict happens and will continue to happen even in the most peaceful of worlds. And that's good. A world where we all agreed with one another would be incredibly boring. Our differences help us to learn. Through conflict handled creativ creatively, through conflict handled creatively, we can change and grow. And I'm not sure real change, either political or personal, can happen without it. So conflict is not necessarily war. We'll, handle, we'll each handle conflict differently and find healing and reconciliation by different paths. I want nonetheless to offer three keys, three skills or qualities which I've found helpful from my own experience. The first skill is naming, being clear and honest about the problem as I see it, starting what, stating what I see and how I feel about it, 
What is important about these statements is that I own them. I see, I feel, not surely it is obvious that, or any right-thinking person should. This ability to name what seems to be going on is crucial to getting the conflict out in the open, not out into the open, where we can begin to understand and try to deal with it. Such a skill is dangerous. It can feel, indeed, it can be confrontational. It feels like stirring up trouble where there wasn't any problem. It needs to be done carefully, caringly, with love, in language we hope others can hear. We need to seek tactfully the best time to do it, but it needs to be done. The second skill is the skill of listening. Listening not just to the words, but to the feelings and needs behind the words. It takes a great deal of time and energy to listen well. It's a kind of weaving, reflecting back, asking for clarification, asking for time in turn to be listened to, being truly open to what we, we're hearing, even if it hurts, being open to the possibility that we might ourselves be changed by what we hear. The third skill is the skill of letting go. I don't mean that in the sense of I don't mean that in the sense of giving up, lying down and inviting people to walk all over us, but acknowledging the possibility that there may be other solutions to this conflict than the ones we've thought of yet. Letting the imagination in, making room for the spirit. We need to let go of our own will, not so as to surrender to another's but so as to look together for God's solution. It's a question of finding ways to let go of our commitment to opposition and separation, of letting ourselves be open to our connectedness as human beings. I think I'll read that last bit again. It's a question of finding ways to let go of our commitment to opposition and separation, of letting ourselves be open to our connectedness as human beings. If we are to do any of these things well, naming, listening, letting go, we need to have learned to trust that of God in ourselves and that of God in those trapped on all sides of the, of the conflict with us. And to do that well, I find I need to be centred, rooted, rooted, practised in waiting on God. That rootedness is both a gift and a discipline, something we can cultivate and build on by acknowledging it every day. The next section doesn't have an author, it's just listed as coming from the year 1833. Section 20.72. It is advised that in all cases of controversy and difference, the persons concerned therein either speedily compose the difference between themselves or make choice of some faithful unconcerned impartial friends to determine the same and that all friends take heed of being parties with one or another. Another one from 1833. This is section 20.73. Let friends everywhere be careful that all differences about outward things be speedily composed either between themselves or by arbitrators. And it would be well that friends were at all times ready to submit their differences, even with persons not of our religious persuasion, to arbitration, rather than to contend at law. This section is from 1994. 20.74 When legal action is required in separation or divorce, this should be the simplest process available consistent with the complexity of the problems involved in the unravelling of a marriage and the need for the best legal advice. Try to, avo try to avoid rancour or undue parade of differences. Try to avoid rancour or undue parade of differences. How great is that? Undue parade of differences. Mediation and conciliation services can often help in the adjustment of such matters and this avoids disputations procedures in courts. Uh, in court. 
The last one is from Alison Sharman from 1986, section 20.75. I come back again and again in my own mind to this word, truth. Promptings of love and truth. That's a quote from Advices and Queries. These two sometimes seem to be in conflict, but in fact, they are inseparable, love and truth. If we are to know the truth, we must be able to see with unclouded eyes, and then we will love what is real and not what is duty or fancy. Once when I was in the middle of a difficult exercise of Quaker decision-making, I wailed to an older and wiser friend, how can I speak the truth in love when I feel no love? Her reply was, unless you speak the truth, there never will be love. <laughs>